So now I'm pleased to welcome Isabel Schnabel, candidate for the position of Executive Board Member of the European Central Bank. On uh, September 25th, Sabine Lothenschlager, member of the Executive Board of the ECB, informed ECB President Draghi that she <laughs> will resign from her position on October 31st, 2019, prior to the end of her term office. In accordance with Article 283.2 of the Treaty of the, on the Functioning of the European Union, the European Parliament is consulted on the Council's recommendation on the appointment of a member of the Executive Board of the European Central Bank. On November 14th, the European Council consulted the Parliament on the appointment of Isabel Schnabel as member of the Executive Board of the ECB for a term of eight years, with effect from January 1st, 2020. <laughs> Ahead of today's public hearing, the candidate has received a written questionnaire of 55 questions. The replies by the candidate are annexed to the draft report. Uh, on the Council recommendation on the appointment of a member of the Executive Board of the ECB. Uh, in this case, as well, the hearing will be followed by a vote at 5 p.m. today. The Econ Committee will then submit a proposal for a European Parliament decision on the Council's recommendation regarding Mrs. Nabel's nomination as candidate for the position of Executive Board Member of the ECB, which is planned to be taken at the plenary sitting of uh, December from 16th to 19th. Um, here again, at the beginning of the hearing, the candidate will make a brief introductory statement of 10 minutes, followed by a question and answer session. So, Ms. Navel, I give you the floor. Thank you very much. Good morning, good morning, buongiorno. <laughs> honorable Madam Chairwoman, honorable members of the European Parliament, I feel honored and humbled to have been nominated for the position of a member of the Executive Board of the European Central Bank. I very much value the role of the European Parliament in the appointment process. This is part of the ECB's accountability, which is an indispensable counterweight to its independence. I highly appreciate to have the opportunity to exchange views with you and answer your questions in today's hearing. In my introductory remarks, I would like to discuss the ECB's monetary policy and the key challenges, challenges it faces in the short and medium term. Beforehand, I will say a few words about my personal qualifications. In my professional career, I have been a researcher and policy advisor with a focus on monetary and financial economics. I have acquired experience in policy advice at national and European level. And I have seen the importance of engaging in the public debate and communicating in an accessible way. As a researcher, I have been studying financial crises, financial regulation, and international capital flows for many years. My research has shown, for example, that too big to fail problems were one cause of the German banking and currency crisis of 1931. I documented that over the past 400 years, bursting asset price bubbles led to more severe crises if they were accompanied by lending booms. I analyzed how fire sales exacerbate financial crises and what central banks can do about it. And I pointed to the harmful effects on the euro area economy of the breakdown of financial integration in the last crisis. As a policy advisor, I contributed to the German and European debate on key economic issues. I'm a member of the German Council of Economic Experts, which is advising the German government and the wider public while being fully independent. I'm vice chair of the advisory scientific committee of the European Systemic Risk Board and have actively participated in debates on financial stability at European level. I'm also co-chair of the Franco-German Council of Economic Experts, which was founded on the basis of the Aachen Treaty by the French and German governments. In these activities, I have always strived to bridge the gap between different perspectives and to reconcile them in, a, in coherent policy proposals. I have also appreciated the value of engaging in a genuine and open dialogue which has guided my discussions with policymakers, professionals, and the wider public. I see it as a fundamental principle to base my views on careful analytical work. And whenever presenting these views, for instance, in op-ads and interviews, I have experienced the importance of being able to explain complex relationships in accessible terms. 
Let me now turn to the challenges for monetary policy. In recent years, the euro area economy experienced an economic upswing with strong growth rates and falling unemployment. Research shows that the ECB contributed significantly to this development through its non-standard monetary policy measures. As a consequence, the threat of deflation vanished. Due to the trade conflict and rising uncertainty, we now see a global slowdown of economic growth, which is also affecting growth in the euro area, in particular through the manufacturing sector. A spillover of this weakness to other sectors could drag the euro area economy into recession. As a consequence, the inflation outlook has weakened, and inflation is forecast to remain well below its objective of below but close to 2% over the medium term. Therefore, at, at its September meeting, the Governing Council of the ECB decided to further expand monetary policy in order to counter these adverse developments and fulfill its mandate of maintaining price stability. In view of weaker price pressures and economic conditions, these decisions appear justified. Nevertheless, it is undeniable that monetary policy is now facing important challenges that have to be addressed, including side effects. The experience of recent years has shown that the effective zero lower bound is lower than the nominal rate of zero. There may, however, be an interest rate level below which monetary policy becomes less effective, what is sometimes referred to as the reversal rate. Against this background, monetary policy cannot be the only game in town, as Christine Lagarde has also emphasized. Structural and fiscal policy will have to play an important role and could raise the effectiveness of monetary policy. This implies using fiscal space where available and warranted and achieving a more growth-friendly composition of public finances. In addition, there are rising concerns about potential negative side effects, such as a buildup of fragilities in the financial system. These concerns have to be taken very seriously because boom and bust episodes can destabilize the economy and threaten price stability. Against the backdrop of low interest rates, we have seen investors search for higher yielding investments. This results in high asset prices and low risk premia, raising fears of abrupt price reversals. The low for long interest rate environment also affects the business models of financial actors, like banks and life insurance companies. Such financial vulnerabilities are primarily to be addressed by macroprudential policies, which can also be adjusted to the specific situations in individual countries and market segments. While finding the best timing and dosage remains a challenge, the buildup of macroprudential buffers is crucial to increase financial institutions' resilience and to be able to counter pro-cyclical effects in the downturn of the financial cycle. In some cases, macroprudential tools and financial regulation, in particular for non-banks, could be further developed. The European Parliament can play a key role in this respect. Beyond the effects on the financial system, many citizens in the euro area are concerned about the consequences of low interest rates for their own lives. They worry about what low rates imply for their savings and pensions. They fear that they will increasingly face negative rates on their deposits. The ECB will have to listen carefully to these concerns. The President has already announced that the ECB will conduct a comprehensive review of its monetary policy framework. I believe that it is important that this includes an analysis of side effects that may affect monetary policy transmission. Moreover, she has announced that communication to the wider public will be a key priority for the ECB. I would be happy to be part of this effort. Explaining the rationale and the effects of the ECB's monetary policy is essential to maintain the trust of Europeans in their central bank. At the same time, it has to be acknowledged that low interest rates in the euro area are not merely of the ECB's making. Long-term interest rate developments are driven by structural and to a large extent global factors, such as demographic change and low productivity growth. Higher interest rates will only come with improved prospects for long-term growth. This, in turn, requires a future-oriented economic policy that focuses on fostering productivity and innovation. Monetary policy can support but not replace growth-enhancing economic policies. This is why it is so important to have an ambitious policy agenda that fosters innovation and investment, including in research, education, physical and digital infrastructure. Further European integration can support this agenda. 
For instance, the creation of truly European banking and capital markets has the potential to increase the resilience of the euro area to future shocks, protect household savings, and offer new investment and financing opportunities to firms of all sizes. These are compelling reasons to complete the banking union and develop a capital markets union, which requires making progress at the same time on further integrating markets and addressing risks. Moreover, a thriving and resilient euro area relies on a fiscal framework that allows for countercyclical policies and promotes investment while ensuring fiscal sustainability. The recommendations of the French-German 7 plus 7 report to which I contributed could serve as a useful blueprint for euro area reform. It had one strong and important message. Stabilizing the euro area requires a balanced approach combining risk sharing and market discipline which complement each other. While market discipline is needed to provide good incentives, risk sharing stabilizes the economy and helps to prevent systemic crises. Completing the economic and monetary union is not the only challenge for European policymakers. Most importantly, economic policy has to deal with climate change, the major challenge of the 21st century. Central banks certainly have a role to play while making sure they are staying firmly within their mandates. How this can be done will feature prominently in the monetary policy review. Likewise, the digital transformation will fundamentally change central banking and banking supervision. The ECB will need to explore the implications of new technologies for its own policies, addressing the risks while using the opportunities it creates. Let me conclude. The most recent Eurobarometer has shown that trust in the euro is at its highest value since the beginning of the survey. The ECB has contributed significantly to this positive development. It has proven an effective institution which is ready to act to fulfill its mandate of ensuring price stability. If confirmed, I would be proud to be part of this institution. If confirmed, I will contribute with all my energy to the ECB's policy making over the next eight years, and let me stress, eight years, for the benefit of the euro area as a whole. Thank you very much for your kind attention. I'm now very much looking forward to our discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now we start our sessions, uh, uh, session of Q&As, and we start with Markus Ferber from EPP. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, if you don't mind, I'll speak in our mother tongue. First of all, I'd like to welcome you, and I'm very pleased uh, that my country has put forward a woman for the second time. I think that's an excellent example for other me member states of the EU. And I'm also very pleased that you just said uh, that uh, uh, you want to break with uh, some of the traditions of uh, other uh, German representatives and uh, stay uh, the, the longer than eight years. In an article in the Handelsblatt not too long ago, uh, you talked about um, the uh, package, and I'm quoting, my opinion is uh, that uh, at this scope uh, wouldn't be necessary at the moment uh, because uh, there isn't a downward spiral at the moment. And then in your answers to our written questions, I'm focusing here on question number five. You talked about the decision of the ECB and defended it. And so I wanted to ask you, what should I... Uh, believe the article that was given to the Handelsblatt or uh, the answers that you've now given in this application to be on the board? Um, how do you assess the policies uh, and what would you do from the 1st of January? Yes, thank you very much, Mr. Ferber. I hope you won't mind, uh, but I'll switch to English for the replies. Thank you very much uh, for this uh, interesting and important uh, question. So, um, as I said already in my introductory statement, the decisions of September reflect the, uh, the global slowdown uh, of the economy. So what we're seeing is that uh, the, uh, the trade conflict has led to a slowdown uh, in global trade, in global growth. This is also felt in the euro area. So uh, growth predictions uh, have been revised downwards and the uh, inflation outlook uh, is now um, uh, uh, more negative than it was uh, before. Uh, and therefore, it was clear that um, the ECB had to act and uh, that it uh, had to conduct further 
measures in order, in order to counter uh, these negative uh, developments. Uh, then, of course, the question is what has to be done. And um, the, uh, the Governing Council agreed, and I certainly would have agreed as well, uh, that a very accommodative stance uh, was needed uh, at the time. Uh, and then there was a discussion uh, about uh, which instruments uh, to use. There was a lot of agreement on lowering uh, the rate on the deposit facility. There was a lot of agreement uh, on, uh, on forward uh, guidance. Um, there was an agreement on the uh, targeted longer-term refinancing operations, but there was not so much agreement uh, on the asset purchases. And um, so I, um, what is reflected in this interview that, uh, that you cited uh, is actually that uh, I probably would have waited with the asset purchases. I, I'm not sure that it was absolutely necessary to start the asset purchases uh, at that time. But what I would like to stress is that nevertheless, this can be justified within the ECB's mandate. And you know this, uh, the, this discussion about whether to restart asset purchases or not was taken place in the governing council. But then in the end, the majority uh, was of the opinion that they should be restarted at that point in time. And given the decision-making procedures of the governing council, this is then the decision of the governing council. And, um, and therefore, I think, um, so if I uh, had voted, maybe I, I, I would have said, uh, maybe we wait with the asset purchases, but in the end, of course, uh, probably the decision would have been uh, the same as it, as it was now. Um, I mean, now the, the mon monetary policy stance uh, is, of course, a very uh, accommodative, and um, uh, so the, uh, the hope is that uh, this will be uh, sufficient in order to bring uh, inflation back uh, to its goal of uh, below but close uh, to 2%. And so we will have to see uh, what is uh, going to happen. Of course, this also depends on uh, what is going to happen uh, in the economy. So the recent uh, data has not been quite as negative as had been feared. So for example, Germany did not enter a technical recession, even though many uh, had predicted that. Uh, so it, uh, the development has, has been a bit more benign than, than feared. And uh, therefore, I think one can be optimistic uh, that uh, the euro area will not enter uh, a recession. And uh, therefore, uh, I'm also optimistic that over the medium term, uh, the inflation uh, will move uh, towards um, uh, its uh, objective, even though we have learned that this can take longer than we had thought. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now Alfred Sand from SND. Thank you. In your replies to questions put to you in preparation for this meeting, you discussed repeatedly structural change. To describe it, you mentioned the advent of cryptocurrencies, digitalization, cybersecurity, the fight against money laundering, an embedded decline in interest rates, aging societies, and transformations of production structures. I think you also mentioned rightly the need to calibrate our measurement tools to keep good track of evolving phenomena economically, financially, and socially. But under SGP rules, we are still coherent with the economic situation that prevailed up to the early 1990s in terms of inflation and public debt criteria, among others. And there are serious doubts about whether the dynamic of those days still has any relevance today, not least because of the structural changes you mentioned. Such doubts I would think need to be clarified. If we are ma facing major discontinuities in the development of our economic systems, do you think we have the means, the tools, the instruments to assess whether this is indeed the case and then to define what we need to do about it? Should the European Central Bank be involved in any such assessment? And if yes, how should it be involved? So thank you, thank you very much for this question. So this is a, this is a very a big question. So what does structural change imply for our economies? And we have, we have big structure, uh, structural changes going on, as you said. I mean, we have uh, demographic uh, changes. We have the, uh, let's say, digital revolution. We also have uh, everything that is uh, related uh, to climate change. Uh, and it is um, uh, very clear that this is going uh, to change many things in our uh, economy. And of course, this also has to be reflected uh, in uh, economic policy. Uh, of course, we should be aware that, um, that many of these changes 
uh, have been going on for a long time. So it's not that suddenly we're entering, uh, that, that we have something like a, like a structural break. I mean, the financial crisis was more of, uh, like a structural break. But these long-term uh, challenges that you were describing uh, have been going on uh, for a long time. And uh, overall, I think that our economies have been able uh, to deal with these changes reasonably well uh, by, of course, by continuously uh, adjusting uh, policies. So I do not think uh, that um, uh, basically we have to change our, our entire design of, of economic policy, which is still serving us uh, uh, very well. Uh, but we have to be open uh, to the new developments and, um, and conduct changes where, uh, where this appears uh, necessary. So uh, when it comes uh, to, uh, to central bank, uh, it is uh, very clear that uh, one major issue um, is the, um, the question of uh, digital currencies. So uh, when payment systems are concerned, um, it is uh, clear that this uh, comes very close also to, uh, to monetary policy, and we've seen this development of cryptocurrencies now for quite some time. Initially, the cryptocurrencies we've seen were not really currencies, but they, they were rather uh, speculative assets, I would say, and they were not really serving the functions uh, of, uh, of currency. So they were not really a, a store of value, they were, were not very often used for, for payments and so on. Uh, but now, uh, I think we have reached a new step with this Libra uh, proposal, which of course is very different. And the main difference is that it is a stable coin, uh, which is backed uh, by uh, a kind of uh, collateral, which of course makes it, its value more stable. And in addition, it is directly linked to the huge uh, network of, of Facebook, uh, which immediately, of course, gives uh, this uh, currency uh, the potential uh, to become a global uh, currency. And therefore, um, um, all policymakers have to watch this development very carefully. And um, in recent um, months, the risks uh, from such currencies have been uh, discussed uh, intensively. I mean, there are risks uh, for the consumers, uh, like um, related to consumer uh, protection. Uh, there are risks related to uh, illegal uh, payments, money laundering, uh, financing of, of terrorism. Um, which may be facilitated through these type of uh, currencies. Uh, there are uh, potential risks to financial stability, which have to be taken very seriously due uh, to the systemic nature of such a payment system. And then, of course, uh, there, um, uh, there could be an effect uh, on uh, monetary policy uh, uh, transmission. And, uh, of course, this would directly impact um, uh, the, the central banks, and this is why they have to look at this very carefully. Uh, just a few seconds. <laughs> so, um, um, of course, what this all reflects is that there are some inefficiencies in the payment system. Otherwise, these private currencies would not come up. And therefore, I think the central banks actually have to uh, react proactively and, and think about what central banks can do in this area, whether we need uh, central bank um, uh, digital currencies or whether the TIPS system uh, mentioned yesterday uh, by, the, uh, by the ECB uh, president uh, can be just, uh, just as good. But these are important challenges which also directly affect central banks. Sorry. No problem. Thank you very much. And now Luis Garicano from Renew. Thanks very much, Madam President. Uh, Madam Schnabel, uh, thanks for, for coming in front of this committee. Uh, uh, the, as Robert Schiller and George Akerlof and other economists have pointed out, narratives are of extreme importance for the economy. Sadly for us, for economists, that's, that's often an afterthought. And I think here we have seen it, uh, particularly with with the Brexit narrative is developed over 23 decades, 20 or 30 years, in which basically all this onslaught of fake news and populism of the European Union has finished with the UK leaving the Union. Sadly, we may be observing something similar uh, with, uh, with respect to monetary policy in the Euro. Some member states have uh, mm, suffered a huge uh, onslaught of what I would call monetary populism. Uh, in, in monetary policy and central banks have been demonized. Uh, they talk about monetary tsunamis, punishing interest rates. Um, and and I, I fear this might have fatal, fatal consequences for the, for the euro. If, uh, if those countries have to suffer two decades of, of hearing that their savings have been 
uh, expropriated by the ECB, then the support for the euro will, will suffer and for our union. Uh, Madame Lagarde seems very aware of this. Uh, on multiple occasions, she repeated before this committee that maintaining a clear messaging will be an essential part of her next eight years. And given your member state origin, it would seem fitting that this part of these duties, I'm afraid, are going to fall on you. And I must say, I don't envy you for that. Um, what do you think, Madame Schnabel, needs to be done to counter these dangerous narratives? In your written responses, you say you will strive to communicate the ECB's policies in order to raise people's understanding of the ECB's decisions and underlying reasoning. What is it that you have in mind exactly? And I would say, to conclude, I, I think that you may think that actually voting on interest rates is, is, your, is your biggest job, and I, I think that will be a big job. But actually, uh, playing a, a role in communicating, explaining what the ECB is doing might be even more important for our long-term future. Thank you. And thank you very much for this extremely important uh, question. So actually, this, this question has been uh, troubling me for, for quite uh, some time. I mean, I'm, um, I'm most closely following the discussion uh, in Germany, and the discussion in Germany is worrying me uh, a lot, um, uh, because it has become also quite aggressive, let's say. And um, the, the problem is that monetary policy is extremely complicated. I mean, uh, there are very few people who really understand uh, what's going on. And so, of course, we cannot expect that the, the general pop population uh, understands what uh, the ECB uh, is doing. And, of course, this is a situation uh, where it's very easy uh, to scapegoat an institution because the people, they don't even understand whether the narrative could be right or, or has to be wrong. It's very hard to, uh, to distinguish. And uh, therefore, I fully, um, I, I fully agree that we really have uh, to start with the more pedagogical effort, trying to explain what monetary policy does. Of course, this is also closely related to financial literacy. And financial literacy is, of course, a much broader task, which cannot just be done. By, um, by central banks, but this is really a task of the, um, uh, of the education system. I mean, um, uh, in, in uh, Germany and I guess in also in other countries, there's now this debate about deposit rates turning negative, nominal rates turning negative. Of course, as economists, we know that what really matters are the real rates, but um, I would say, I don't know, 90% of the population probably are not aware that there is such a, uh, such a distinction. And therefore, we also need an effort um, to improve uh, financial literacy. Um, so this scapegoating is extremely dangerous. It, uh, it may damage the trust in the euro. And therefore, if I am confirmed, I will really make this one of my clear priorities. Um, I uh, will try to communicate, and not just in Germany, because it's not just Germany, it's other countries. I mean, we've had the discussion in the Netherlands. We have had other types of discussions, of course, in other countries. I mean, if we go back a couple of years in the euro area crisis, there was also a lot of misunderstanding about the ECB. So this is a much broader task, and I would not be a German representative in the ECB, but I would be responsible for the euro area as a whole. And therefore, I would also think that this communication task should be directed at the euro area uh, as a whole. And of course, there's only uh, so much that um, a single person can do, but uh, whatever I can do, I, I would do. I think there are also ways to do this in a, in a digital fashion. I mean, the ECB now has these uh, nice explanatory videos. I don't know whether you've seen them. Um, uh, they're very nice. I, I still think they're far too complicated. They're far too complicated. People won't, won't understand. It's still, it's still for, more for economists than for the wider public. We have, to be, we have to be very simple to make people understand what we're doing and why they're benefiting from what we're doing. Thank you very, <coughs> very, very much. And now, uh, Jake Lunas from Greens. <coughs> Thank you, Chair. Madam Sabel, I'm uh, really impressed by your uh, commitment uh, from your uh, introductory statements, from your answers to the questions, and also by your uh, research into 400 years of uh, crisis uh, history. Uh, in one of the uh, replies to your questions, you talk about fragilities in the financial sector. Could you elaborate a little bit more about uh, what you think the fragilities remain? Are they uh, managed properly by the changes in the banking union supervision, all the uh, uh, ratios, uh, capital ratios, liquidity ratios, other ratios? Are they enough 
uh, to, to, to manage these problems. And also I'd like your comment on uh, a couple of books if you uh, had a chance to, to, to read them or look at them. One of them is uh, Nouriel Roubini's uh, Crisis Economics, uh, where he analyzes also the history of the crisis, mechanics of the global crisis, and he mentions the fragilities as well. But beyond the financial sector, he mentions the, for example, credit rating uh, agencies, their financing model was uh, not proper at all. So, you know, would you agree with his analysis? And another book I'd like to mention is uh, Hyman Minsky's uh, uh, Stabilizing an Unstable Economy where he also identifies the uh, role of the financial sector, its size. The book was written in 1986, uh, republished uh, 11 years ago. So, so, you know, and he mentions one specific thing, three types of lending or borrowing, depending on which side you look at uh, on the balance sheet. And the, 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 the third, the worst uh, borrowing uh, uh, type is uh, Ponzi borrowing. Uh, and the governments, uh, when they borrow, they cannot, uh, you know, give back uh, the, the, the loans, they basically refinance, and in order to grow, they need uh, inflation to a certain extent, because uh, that's how the, uh, you know, refinancing could happen. So uh, could you comment on these fragilities and the insights, if uh, any you would have from, uh, from these books? Thank you. Thank you, uh, thank you very much. So, I mean, I've been working on these fragilities for basically all my, uh, all my academic life, so I could talk about this for uh, several hours. I don't have the time, uh, unfortunately. So let me try to, to concentrate on, the, uh, on uh, some, major, um, uh, some major things. So uh, what, of, what type of uh, fragilities um, uh, do we uh, see? So uh, we, we do see um, a, a relatively high uh, asset prices. Um, uh, especially in the, uh, in the real estate uh, market, um, we, um, we do see a high degree of maturity transformation um, in the banking sector. And uh, what actually troubles me most there is that uh, this leads, um, at least in certain countries, to a substantial buildup of interest rate risk. Uh, because if, uh, I mean, nobody thinks that this will happen anytime soon, but at some point it may actually happen, interest rates go up, uh, then this would uh, actually be, uh, be a problem for, uh, for banks which have these uh, loans with long maturities at, at, very, uh, at, very low, um, at very low rates. I mean, we should not just think about banks. We have um, insurance companies, which are, of course, um, struggling with the low interest rate um, uh, environment and uh, who have trouble to uh, pay the, the guaranteed um, rates. The same for, uh, for pension funds. We have the uh, asset management sector. Again, there uh, it's to a large extent um, a liquidity issue. Uh, we have, of course, um, compressed risk premium due to a, a search for yield. And um, uh, in order to deal with that, we have over the last couple of years, we have introduced many regulations to deal with that. And I think the financial sector has become much more resilient. I mean, we have maybe focused a bit too much on the banking sector, have done a bit, a bit too little on, uh, on other sectors. We have done a lot. One problem is, and actually we've written that in a, a recent report of the Advisory Scientific Committee at the European Systemic Risk Board, the regulation has, has become very complex, very hard to understand, also very expensive from the viewpoint uh, of the regulated entities. And I think this is something that we will have to look at uh, again. I would have a preference for having much higher capital requirements, but a much less complex regulation. I think this would be a way uh, to go, which I find very promising. I, I, I don't know why the banks themselves don't make this proposal because I think it would serve them very well. Very quickly, on the credit, uh, credit, agent, uh, credit rating agencies, I think it's perfectly right. The financing model, I think, is, is not appropriate. Regarding Minsky, I mean, Minsky is the, the person who influenced all this literature about the financial cycles. It has been extremely influential, and I think this is, uh, this is very, uh, very interesting. And when we talk about macroprudential uh, policy, I, I should talk about ma macroprudential policy more, but I don't have the time. Um, I mean, this is basically uh, very closely attached to what uh, Minsky has done. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now Gunnar Beck from ID. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, vielen Dank, Frau Fos yes, thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair. And good morning, Mrs. Schnabel. Well, I'm not really sure if you've made a good start here. In the middle of November, 
you were calling on German uh, economics uh, academics to uh, spread false news. Uh, well, sorry, uh, false criticisms or unjustified criticisms of uh, the current policies because you, you felt that these statements would endanger the euro. And then we have Mario Draghi with his uh, speculator-friendly monetary policy, and he's failed with that. We've got the lowest growth in the developed world, and the divide between rich and poor is greater than ever. In addition, the ECB in its financial stability review has finally admitted that the accommodative monetary policy has led to overvalued shares and bonds and uh, excessive debt in crisis countries and crisis companies. And you can also read that the uh, weaker banks are now even less profitable and more fragile than before quantitative easing. So, as you feel, as you see it, do you think that we have uh, been able to put... Uh, I mean, are these the kind of statements that you were thinking about? These are statements from the OECD and the ECB. So, is, is this the kind of thing that you were talking about when you're talking about damaging statements? As you see it, where does the line go between damaging and false statements? Are you trying to uh, decide whether whether that is a, an inadmissible or rather justified criticism? There's another point that uh, you could uh, comment on for me. According to the Set Bank, German savers... have uh, done without 664.8 billion euros in uh, uh, revenue on their savings. That's due to the low interest rates. You're complaining uh, that these people are uh, uh, economically illiterate. I think that that's a little bit arrogant. So I'm going to switch to, uh, to English. Um, so... Um what are wrong narratives? So in my view, a wrong narrative is one that ignores um, the uh, fundamental economic knowledge or institutional facts, right? This does not mean, and by the way, I added a second tweet saying exactly that, this does not mean that one should not criticize the ECB. I've myself criticized the ECB uh, many times. And I think that's important. That's actually part of also of the accountability that it's criticized. I mean, we need this discussion also in the public. I think that is very important. But we should not criticize the ECB on, uh, on um, issues that are simply uh, not true. And let me, I mean, you ask for uh, examples. And an example of a wrong narrative is that the ECB is expropriating the German saver. This is a very popular narrative in Germany, and it is clearly wrong. Because, I mean, first, the term expropriation in this context is simply not legitimate. And second, it's, of course, not the responsibility of the ECB to, uh, to give high rates to the savers, but to preserve uh, price stability. Um, I mean, there are many, many other examples. The things that you named are the side effects of monetary policy. And of course, they have to be discussed, and even the ECB itself, as you mentioned, discusses them in its financial stability review. I think this is extremely important. I think this has to be done. I think this will be done more in the future. This will be part of the monetary policy review. This is crucial. I myself worried about the side effects, especially with respect to financial stability. We have to take that very seriously. And this has nothing to do with narratives that have to be dispelled. The narratives that have to be dis dispelled are uh, basically uh, the, 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 the wrong statements, which everybody should agree are false. Uh, regarding the uh, DZ Bank um, report, I mean, that's, um, at, at that point, um, this is not a, a wrong statement. It's simply incomplete, because when we think about the distributional uh, effects, 
uh, of monetary policy, we should not just see as people as savers, but we have also have to be aware that, uh, that they are employees. So if monetary policy has a stabilizing effect for the economy and people don't lose uh, uh, their, their jobs, uh, then of course this is a very uh, positive um, uh, effect um, uh, on, uh, on the population. And if we want to have a comprehensive view of how monetary policy affects the people, I mean, there will, of course, uh, we have to look at all these effects together. There will be a lot of heterogeneity. I mean, we know that people of a different age, for example, will be affected very differently. Creditors and debtors will be affected differently. And of course, it could be that high and low income people will be affected differently. But it is far from clear, by the way, that it's really the low-income people who suffer, because these are not the people who typically have the savings. The lowest, I don't know, 40% in Germany, for example, don't, don't really have much savings. But they are the ones who possibly got a job because economic growth was stronger than it would have been in the absence of monetary policy. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now Mr. Van Overveld from ECR. Thank you, uh, Madam Schnabel. Thank you for being here. Uh, just a few minutes ago, you made a quite strong statement where you said, and I quote, there are very few people who really understand what is going on. I find that a remarkable <coughs> statement, and I respectfully disagree with that statement. And I think it's high time that central bankers start to realize that by often deliberately using very veiled, very obscure language, they contribute to non-understanding uh, and I hope uh, in emphasizing communication skills that you can contribute to improve that situation. I have furthermore two questions. First of all, um, Mr. Slagarde, Mr. Panetta, you yourself referred uh, quite often to side effects of present monetary policies, and I would like very much to hear from you the two side effects, question of limiting it, that are of most concern to you at this point in time. My second question is about uh, climate change or the fight against climate change, which uh, Madame Lagarde defined, and I quote again, as a mission critical priority. Mr. Jens Weidmann of the Bundesbank, whom you certainly also know, uh, almost simultaneously said the following. And I quote again, a monetary policy which pursues explicitly environmental policy objectives is at risk of being overburdened. I would very, like, very much like to know your position on this discussion too. Thank you. Thank you very much for, uh, for these questions. Very, very briefly on the first point, I think um, you are actually perfectly right. The communication of monetary policy in the past has been too technical. We have to start to communicate, not just to the professionals, not just to the markets, but to the public. And this has to be done in a non-technical way. And I've been a teacher for a long time, and I know in principle how, how to do that. I mean, uh, and I think we should do it. I mean, it's always a simplification. It's maybe never 100% correct, but we have to do it, and we cannot stay at this technical level. I think that is actually a very important task, and therefore I think this comment is well taken. Regarding the uh, second, uh, two, uh, uh, the, uh, the second point, the two most important side effects, I would say, um, so the first is financial stability, and um, I would say the uh, second is the impact on, uh, on savers, um, because uh, I think that um, politically this will be a very, very big issue. I mean, I'm uh, aware of the fact that this is not really part of uh, the mandate, the ECB's mandate, to give high interest rates to savers, but I see that this is a huge political issue, and uh, we, have to, uh, we have to take uh, care of that, but I, I, I mean, I, one has to be aware of the fact that when it comes to the low level of interest rates, this is, of course, not just uh, the ECB, as I also mentioned in my introductory statement, but um, this is uh, uh, driven partly by long-run trends, and it's very closely related uh, to productivity. And when it comes to productivity, it's not the ECB that can do it. But that is really the governments um, um, that have to conduct future-oriented policies, that have to invest, that have to foster innovation, um, and, and so on, uh, in order to raise productivity. And that is the way to 
get interest rates up. The, uh, the ECB, the monetary policy, can support that, but as I said in my uh, initial statement, it cannot replace the structural policies of the government. I think that is a very crucial uh, point, but nevertheless, I think this is, uh, is very important. Regarding climate change, I mean, climate change is the single biggest issue that we're facing. I think this is very clear, and I think it's also clear that every single policymaker has to think about what it can do with respect to climate change. The central bank is bound by its mandate, and this means it cannot do everything. And certainly, climate change is not the primary mandate of the ECB. The primary mandate is price stability, but of course, as a secondary mandate, the ECB is supposed to support the general economic policy, um, and um, climate change uh, can be part of that but only as long as it does not conflict with its primary objective. And I think that is very important, and this means that monetary policy is limited. It cannot do everything. And um, um, I think one has to stress that, when it, that um, the ECB will not be the institution that is able to really deal with climate change. This has to be done by the governments. We need a comprehensive system of carbon pricing uh, and so on. Um, and this cannot all be done by the ECB, but the ECB can do many things. And I cannot answer that now, but maybe someone else asks the questions. <laughs> Thank you very much. And now Mr. Schurdevan from GUE. Yes, thank you very much, Chair. Thank you very much, Mrs. Schnabel. Thank you for coming here today and presenting your program. You uh, have uh, had a very interesting discussion here with some of the colleagues. Uh, perhaps I could uh, follow up on that. Uh, uh, yesterday, during the monetary dialogue with uh, uh, Christine Lagarde, she talked about the revision of uh, the monetary uh, strategy. You mentioned that I have a specific graphic. Do you think there is a need to have a strategic change in the uh, monetary policy? And if yes, uh, w what would that change be? And what would the uh, strategic change be? And uh, what would you do for that on the board? And then the second question, you just talked about price stability, and uh, you talked about the mandate, and that is the primary mandate of the, the ECB. Uh, but uh, also um, uh, sustainable growth or supporting uh, sustainable economic growth. Uh, what would the situation be with regard to other uh, issues uh, such as full employment, such as uh, a balanced uh, trade book? Um, are these things that you think uh, the uh, e ECB sh uh, should be taking into account when it's looking at its strategic policy. Yes, thank you very much for the question. So the ECB, in, in the monetary policy review, the ECB cannot change its mandate, right? It's not the job of the ECB to change its own mandate. So we have to take the mandate as given. And I actually think uh, the mandate as it is um, does a good job. So I would, um, I, I would not start a discussion now about changing the mandate, but that is basically uh, your responsibility and it's not the ECB which, uh, th that can do this. Um, I think this monetary policy review is very important. Um, the ECB has only once done a policy review and that was a long time ago in uh, 2003, and since then, many things have happened, and the economy has changed fundamentally, and also monetary policy has changed fundamentally. New tools have been developed, and the, the, the threat that we are facing is very different from what we had back then. Back then, everybody was worried about excessive inflation. I mean, you must remember the discussion. I mean, the goal was that the ECB uh, should be modeled after Bundesbank because Bundesbank was, people thought that they could guarantee low inflation. But now after the financial crisis, we're actually facing the opposite threat, which is too low uh, inflation. And uh, we also find, uh, find that uh, some of um, the mechanisms that we have relied on seem to work differently than uh, they used to work before. Uh, think about the Phillips curve, for example, which is 
the relationship between uh, unemployment and uh, inflation. So um, there is an intensive uh, academic discussion about um, what is actually uh, going on. Some people say the Phillips curve uh, has broken down. Others say um, uh, it's uh, just flattening. Um, but we have to understand this better. And this means we need an extensive review based on comprehensive analytical work, uh, including also, uh, I think, academics who can do some of the, uh, the underlying uh, work in order to see um, uh, how the instruments function, what are the, um, what are the side effects, uh, that's a very important part of the monetary policy uh, review, what are the side effects, uh, is, uh, what are the determinants of the natural um, uh, interest rates, um, uh, what does this imply for uh, the inflation uh, target, and only after such a very careful and uh, a comprehensive uh, analysis, um, we can decide um, what to do. And in the end, it could be that the adjustments are not that big, right? I mean, that's not, that's, it's not clear that in the end we're going to overhaul the, 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 the entire system. Actually, I don't think that will be the case. It may be some clarifications, maybe some uh, small changes, um, probably the, the, uh, the biggest issue will be how can we uh, integrate uh, other objectives and the most important one will be uh, climate change. And um, so how can we do so uh, without endangering um, the mandate, without endangering uh, independence? I think this really has to be the guide uh, in, uh, also in, um, in that monetary policy review that the ECB also must not threaten its independence. Thank you very much. Now Mrs. Hübner from EPP. Thank you, uh, Chair, very much. I, I would like to ask you uh, one question about the international role of Euro first. And I, uh, you probably would agree with me that never in the history of the EMU from the very first moment of Euro, there has been uh, any uh, appetite to strengthen the international role of Euro, and there have been many factors behind this uh, uh, neutral uh, approach, and to one of them uh, certainly was this uh, concern that uh, why the globally um, uh, used uh, currency uh, could put a, a lot of constraints on the ECB monetary policy, because the situation would be very different. So, but now we see a certain change of heart, and we have heard already from the Commission there are some steps being made in this direction. I would like to, to ask you, what do you think about this move towards a stronger international role of Euro, and if there would be at all uh, any role for the ECB if we take this um, uh, path forward? And my second question is related to the Governing Council. Mr. Panetta, in, in an hour ago, in response to Marcus Ferber's question about the Governing Council, has explained in a very posit positive way, a very constructive process of decision-making in the Governing Council. But we, in Econ, we have rather bad experience with a, a far-reaching lack of transparency uh, of the Governing Council toward us uh, here very different depending on the, on the member, but nevertheless, uh, that has been the, uh, the experience. And uh, I, we also hear from time to time that there are some efforts on the um, governing council or member side to also uh, push, to put some pressure on the ECB in the context of monetary policy. I would like to, to ask you, how do you evaluate this relationship and do you also need to see, to, to do you also see the need to change the, the procedure the ECB uh, uses? Uh, would you be prepared also to share more, operation, more information with us on how um, this, uh, this uh, operate? Um, and also, would you see the need of having a governing council a little bit more transparent? And what are the limits for transparency of the governing council? Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, 
Yeah, so uh, of course, the, this uh, is another big discussion, the international role of the uh, euro, and I agree with you. A couple of years ago, there was very little appetite to talk about that, but um, um, I think the change is also due to the fact that the geopolitical situation has, has changed uh, uh, completely, and that there is an understanding in, uh, in Europe that, uh, that Europe uh, also has to play a stronger role uh, in, the, uh, in the world. Um, and the currency, of course, is a very powerful uh, tool for that. Um, I mean, I never, I, I mean, I'm not sure whether um, this, um, uh, so um, how much emphasis I would put on that specific uh, goal. But I, um, I think that it is very closely related to this debate um, about the safe asset. And the safe asset uh, is discussed in, um, in many other uh, contexts. And um, I, I think the one uh, context um, is euro area reform. And uh, there, um, I mean, we have all this discussion about, uh, about EDIS, about the regulation of uh, sovereign exposures, uh, the fear that the regulation of sovereign exposures may uh, destabilize sovereign debt markets. And then some people say that this uh, European safe asset is something like the silver bullet, which can put it all together. And uh, in a sense, I mean, maybe, maybe that's true, but of course we know that when it comes to a, uh, to a common uh, European asset, there are quite a few people who worry a lot about uh, the mutualization of risk. And uh, in the current situation that we have, um, we, uh, we cannot have this mutualization of risk because we have a union of sovereign states. And so if there is to be a safe asset, uh, it has to be designed in a way uh, such that uh, market discipline is still there, that there is not a mutualization uh, of risk, and I think we need much more research to understand how uh, this can be done. Very quickly on the governing council. Um, so um, I personally think the governing council is already very transparent. I mean, uh, uh, I think uh, if you look at the accounts, um, I, I find them quite, uh, quite extensive, very uh, detailed. Um, I mean, what you don't have, and maybe this is what you are asking for, is so you don't have formal votes, and you don't know who voted how, how many people voted, and, how, and who voted how. But I'm, I must say I'm a bit skeptical there. Um, so we already have, um, let's say, the, the, the problem uh, that um, um, sometimes the um, heads of the national central banks are perceived as representatives of their own country. And I think this is very harmful. I mean, that shouldn't be the case. They're all um, uh, representing the euro area as a whole. And so if you have voting and the voting becomes public, my prediction would be that the political pressure on individual members uh, would increase substantially. And I, I, I don't think that is, a, that is a good idea. Thank you very much. Now, Mr. Belka from SND. Thank you. Uh, I have two questions. Mario Draghi was quoted as saying, we put jobs between savers' income. Of course, this referred to the criticism of ultra-low interest rate policy. And my, I'm not even sure whether M Mario Draghi actually said this. Nevertheless, this trade-off can be put in such an extreme way by, by many observers. Could you elaborate on this? What is your opinion on this trade-off? Second question. The ECB is fighting so far and successfully, so far successful, and successfully to bring back inflation back to 2%, exactly as the Bank of Japan. Well, how different is the Eurozone from Japan that we think that we can succeed in bringing up inflation to the target? Thank you. Okay, so on the, uh, on the first point, I um, already el elaborated um, uh, a bit on that. I mean, uh, from the viewpoint of the ECB, it's not really a trade-off, let's say, because the, um, the mandate is price stability. And um, through ach achieving that, the ECB affects employment, economic growth, inflation, 
and of course interest rates, right? And um, monetary policy always has distributional consequences. This is unavoidable, but it doesn't have a distributional mandate. So there is no, I mean, it cannot take the decision who should gain and who should lose. And uh, therefore, um, the, um, uh, I mean, kind of the, the distributional consequences, they are um, more or less natural result of monetary policy, but then the consequences of that have to be dealt with at the uh, political um, level. So, for example, I mean, if we think about the, I mean, the low uh, interest rate, uh, I was referring to that uh, debate that we're having in, uh, in Germany. Of course, we know that at the same time, the governments have been saving a lot of money, right? So government, the government has, has uh, won because uh, they, uh, they're highly indebted. Um, they paid much lower interest rates. And so there is some scope uh, to deal with these distributional issues. The ECB, in the end, cannot take the decision who should gain and who should lose. This is not, this is not part of, um, uh, of the ECB's um, mandate. So um, when it comes to the uh, comparison between, um, between the euro area um, and um, uh, Japan, uh, there certainly are some uh, parallels. I mean, one of the parallels uh, is that um, that there was a deep uh, banking crisis, which uh, kind of was at the uh, at the beginning uh, of the uh, of the problem. Also, I mean, uh, some of the uh, of the structural issues uh, are there. I mean, the demographic um, change, for example, is something that is also it's, it's a big issue in Japan, of course, but it's also a big issue in the uh, euro area. Um, but apart from that, the situation uh, of Japan and the euro area, I think, is, uh, is very different in the sense um, that uh, Japan is a sovereign state with, uh, with uh, its own central bank, while um, uh, the euro area is uh, a currency union. And this has uh, many implications, uh, and it implies that one has to be very careful in drawing too many parallels from the one situation uh, to, um, uh, to the other. Uh, then, of course, the, um, the euro area has done, has conducted uh, many reforms in order uh, to deal, uh, for example, uh, with the instabilities that became uh, obvious in the global financial and euro area uh, crisis. Uh, the banking union uh, is a very uh, important, um, uh, very important uh, part of that. Um, uh, also, there has been, um, I mean, at, actually at global level, a very uh, decisive uh, or determined um, response uh, with respect to um, banking regulation to strengthen the financial uh, sector. In Japan, that was uh, taking um, uh, much longer. Um, then, um, uh, of course, the, uh, I mean, there was the issue of a, a sovereign uh, debt problem in the uh, euro area, something uh, that Japan uh, is, not, um, is not facing. I mean, they're having very high um, uh, public debt, uh, but it, it seems, uh, still seems to be sustainable. Uh, and therefore, in the end, I think one, um, uh, the situations are, are very different, and I wouldn't draw um, too strong parallels. Thank you very much. So now we have uh, concluded the uh, Q&A questions. So uh, thank you to my colleagues and uh, thank you, Mrs. Uh, Schnabel, uh, for, thank you. for the uh, hearing. So now we can move to the next point. Uh, just uh, give a couple of minutes uh, to allow the change of scenery.